So again, let me say welcome to lecture 14. Um, we're going to be looking at rational expressions. Um, rational expressions are, are not tough things. I mean, you guys have dealt with fractions before. Um, and when we deal with fractions, we know there's lots of wonderful things that go along with it. Um, we know that when we add them, we need the common denominator, for example. We know we can reduce fractions to lowest terms. So there's various little skills that, that we've had to learn, you know, over time. So we're going to be recalling all those skills that we have used in the past on fractions. And we're just going to apply them to what we were now going to call rational expressions. Basically, a rational expression is just the ratio of two polynomials. In other words, it's a big old fraction containing expo excuse me, containing polynomials in its numerator and its denominator. Okay? It's basically a giant fraction full of a lot of stuff, algebra stuff. <laughs> to be silly about it. But truly, you know, um, so, uh, but important word here, ratio. Notice the word ratio is contained in rational. The ratio is the first part of the word rational. And we know that a ratio is a fraction, right? So that'll help you know that when you see the word rational expression or something to that effect coming up, you're going to be doing, dealing with some of your fraction rules that you've de dealt with in the past. And we have a question. Oh, thank you, Viv. I see you. Okay, so but before we go there, let's go ahead and do these warm-ups. You're going to be using some exponent rules, okay? Your exponent rules uh, and quite a few sub-skills, a lot of skills that you've used before. Of course, you have your fraction rules, uh, your exponent rules. And I'm totally drawing blank, but there's a lot of other sub-skills that you're going to have to, to draw upon. So as we go through this section, by the way, it's a really good thing to study before the final because it, it, you may run into something that you, are get, you get stuck on, and it might be a sub-skill where you have a skill gap and you need to work on that. Maybe you need to go back. So if you all need extra problem sets, let me know. Okay? Oh, and factoring. Yeah by the way. So those sub-skills that we're going to use for rational expressions, okay, to simplify them or really to add, subtract, multiply, and divide as well, um, you're going to need to know your exponent rules. So if you suffered on any of the things, especially the things I'm writing down right here on the right, like factoring is a huge part of this, okay? So if you, you were still kind of dragging on the factoring, you need to like get with me and let me help you a little bit, okay? Or get with someone. I'll help you find a tutor if you want someone to go work with you in person. You know, buy me a plane ticket, I'd go there too. I'd love to go to the California area. It's beautiful. All right, so anyway, uh, exponents factoring, it's all your fraction rules, operations on fractions. Okay, and of course, always your order of operations. Okay, but let's take a look at these warm-up problems, okay, here on the left, okay, and so this is A, and I'm just going to say the directions will be to simplify, okay, so part A, and so <laughs> I chose these because of the exponent properties that we're having to deal with, so here's what's going to happen here, you have a choice, and so, and it will be the same in, in expressions, sometimes you can you can reduce inside the parentheses before you to carry out the larger fourth power outside of the parentheses. You can reduce on the inside, or you can bring the four in and then reduce everything at one time. But in a problem like this, it may be easier to kind of work inside those parentheses first. So we'll bring this down, and we'll just kind of focus on what's inside the parentheses first, okay? And so I'm going to write that in red is what we're looking at first. I'm going to give us some room. I'm just kind of rewriting everything with a little bit more room between. Okay. And so 5 goes into itself once, right? Pay close attention to how we reduce, right? It goes into 24 times. 
Okay, and of course, let's kind of carry over here and bring our fraction bar. So it leaves us with a 4 in the denominator. Okay, so let's go to the x's. Remember that this is x to the first power in that denominator, right? The single x in the denominator cancels with one of the x's in the numerator. Now look, let me go just below that and show you something here, okay? This is like x cubed over x to the first power, basically, right? So you can write x times x times x over x. If you forget how to deal with your exponents, the good news is you can go back to the basic definition of what an exponent is, like I'm doing here in this little gray area, and you can you can do it. You know the rules are help to help us work efficiently. There's usually I'm gonna say usually not always, but usually more than one way to do these. Okay, so back to the problem in the y's. The y to the first power in our numerator will cancel one from the five that are in the denominator, so it takes one off of there. So in our numerator, we have what? x to the second power. Okay, let me get this right color here. So x to the second power, and in our denominator, y to the fourth. Be sure you put them where they belong, okay? Um, I'll, oftentimes, I'll see students that uh, will place uh, the answer, the, the x in the denominator when it should have been in the numerator, or vice versa. So be sure that if if something you go cancel your factors, if it if it ends up being canceled and is in the denominator, make sure you place it in the denominator in the next step. It put it in the right area of your fraction. And um, it seems like a silly thing to say, but it, it's true. It's something that oftentimes people will um, kind of mess that one up. All right, so let's go on to the next example. This is the answer, by the way. We're done with this one. Let me know if you have a question. Anybody, anybody with questions, raise your hand. Okay. All right. So now with this one, oh, wait, did I not? I didn't finish it, did I? Hello. I know. I caught myself as I'm going on to that other one. I see it now. Yeah, we're not done with this one. I'm so sorry. Let me get rid of that. Hello. Okay, you guys. So what did I forget? I forgot this part right here so now I just all I did was inside the parentheses now I have to actually bring in this fourth power <laughs> hello Karen okay guys let's see where is this right here is that what you were raising your hand about Viv <laughs> okay all right awesome okay so now we're bringing the fourth in the fourth power excuse me y'all sorry about that Okay, so the four exponent will be applied to every factor inside the set of parentheses, whether it's a numerator or denominator. So every factor inside parentheses gets applied the fourth power. In other words, what we'll write, this is what it'll end up looking like here. We'll have x squared to the fourth power, right? And I'm just writing it out in this step. You don't necessarily have to write the step I'm writing here. But if you would like to, it's fine. So we get 4 to the 4th power, right? And then what? y to the 4th gets the 4th power as well. So every factor inside gets the 4th power, you know, gets put raised to the 4th power. So now we can kind of go through and use our skills here. We have... When we raise a power to another power, so I'm raising a square to a fourth power, I multiply, right? And so here, let's go for that. So we'll have x to the eighth power. And then, of course, 4 to the fourth power is what? 16 squared. Let's see, let me get my calculator to make sure I'm not, I don't want to like screw up another one 256 so we have 256 and then y to the fourth power raised to the fourth power again multiply when you're raising a power to another power you multiply so we'll have y to the 16th power okay and now we're officially done with this one okay any questions on this 
this is the final answer. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'm just kind of excited to go on to rational expressions. I was kind of jumping the gun there. Okay, on this one now, we have um, a couple of little areas here. We want to first handle these two separate sets of parentheses separately. I kind of be re I was redundant there. Excuse me. These two independent sets of parentheses. We're going to handle them one at a time. Okay, let me get my pen back up and... So let's handle the little blue section first. Let's go here. We're raising everything, every factor inside of the parentheses gets raised to the second power. So if I write that out, here's what it'll look like. Let me see. Get a good color here. So this is what that is going to be. It's going to be 2 squared, C squared, D to the fourth power squared right okay and then the second set of parentheses there will get the 5 applied to it as, a, as its exponent so we'll have that times c to the fifth power and d to the fifth power and then of course we go back and, and now we're going to go apply those exponents right so what do we have now so 2 squared is 4 we have c squared, and what I'm going to do is kind of write them, the c factors next to one another, okay? So when I go back for my next step, I can go ahead and clear up all those things at one time. See them next to one another, it'll help. d to the fourth power squared is going to be 4 times 2 as my new exponent, so multiply. And then, of course, d to the fifth, okay? Any questions about what, I, what I've done here, how I've uh, organized that? It would probably help you, especially on a long problems like this, to kind of write, you know, once you've brought in the, the overall exponent and you have just a string of factors like this, it's okay to put the, the matching factors next to one another so you can deal with it. Okay, so we have what? Four. Where's my pen? Let's see. Put my pen. Or C to the, now when I'm multiplying straight across, right, what do I do with the exponents here? I add them, right? Multiplying straight across, the bases must match, right? In other words, we have to be raising the same thing to some power, right? See that? That's the base. Those have to match for us to be able to apply this rule of add your exponents when you're multiplying straight across. So now we'll have c to the seventh power, okay? And then, of course, d to the thirteenth power. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> and that's done. This is done. Okay? Are there any questions about exponent rules or any ideas of what you would want to see? I think I would like to pull one that is a negative exponent in it just to kind of remind you of how to deal with that. So let me do that. Let me find an, a good idea for that one. Whoops. All right, come back. Let's see. I'm going to dig. I see one. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Two. Or I know what I can do. I can just do this too. Watch. Okay, so here's C. Let's have part C. I'm just going to write one for y'all. I kind of just get an idea of one. Yeah, there we go. Right there. I see what I want to do. We'll have 2. I should have had a V8. Okay. X to the negative 2. Y to the cubed. Over 8. X to the 5th y to the negative 4, okay? And so we have to simplify this, okay? Yeah, oh, I see a question. Hold on. Go ahead and start while I look at this question. You guys try to get something done. No, in the first example, was one of the exponents negative? No, look, the first example is right. The original problem is right here for the first one. This is how it was. 
So no negative exponents yet. I mean, the only the closest thing to a negative exponent there was when I was canceling my x's and had to subtract however many. But no, not given to us in the problem though. So, um, but this is fine. This will work. Okay, so we're going to cancel 2, goes into itself once, into 8, 4 times. All right, so how do we deal with these? There's a couple ways we can go about it. I'm going to go ahead and write a step here. Actually, <clears throat> let me write it in like a gray color because it's one of those steps that you can choose to do, you can choose not to do. You might handle it differently, you know, when you're on the, on the go, I guess, when you're doing these yourself. Now, I would go ahead and the, gray, the step what I'm talking about here is this. If I have a positive exponent, I'm going to write it wherever it is. I'm going to leave it in the numerator or denominator. It's these guys that I'm going to write kind of, wait, come back. Where is, where to go? Where to go? <laughs> trying to find my highlighter. Here's the problem, child, right here, right, children. So, okay, so I'm going to write those guys in the opposite side of the fraction bar with a positive version, okay? And so here's how this will go. Find my pin. So x to the negative 2 will become x to the positive 2 in the denominator. And if you see that y to the negative 4th in the denominator, that will become y to the positive 4 up in the numerator. So I'm going to highlight once again the things that I moved so that the exponents could become positive. Remember, you cannot leave a negative exponent in your answers. It's not simplified if you have remaining negative exponents. So you have to clear those up in order for it to be fully simplified. Okay, and the purpose of doing what I just did, rewriting it this way, is so that, look how nice it is. I got the y's by them, by each other, and the x's are next door to each other. It's much simpler now to just kind of go another step and and apply the exponent property that I need to apply. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so we'll have what? We'll have y to the seventh power. I need to add those exponents, right? Because I'm multiplying straight across. I have matching bases. I add the exponents. Four and then x to the seventh power in the denominator as well. And this is that. So how do you decide to go about this? I mean, it's not that it's a different way to do it. It's just that there's different rules you can apply first, I guess you could say. And the more you practice these, the better I know, the better it'll get. It really is helpful to do that worksheet I sent to you guys. But start from the very beginning. Don't skip straight to the negative exponents. If you really had some trouble understanding these, start with the first problems that are given to you. There's a purpose as they build you up to the skills you need to be at. You know, there's a, they have a method through doing these examples, the practice of it. And it'll help you remember and really make give you a solid understanding of those rules. Okay. In the beginning, I had kind of given you guys these two little problems here. <clears throat> just to kind of give you a little review of that, um, let's see, I um, was going to kind of just let y'all pick one of them to do and uh, send y'all the answer or in the end I can do the other one, but um, I was going to, I wanted to choose 11 here, let me kind of focus in on that one, I'm going to put this other one out of the way, because we've done that, I want to just look here at 11, okay. Okay, come on, come over here, 11. Quickly, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because that was last time. So let's just take a look. The reason I put this one up was um, because I wanted to show you all this last week, and it kind of slipped my mind, but I wanted to show you guys that you can turn vertex form into general form and vice versa. We did general form into standard form. But we never turned any standard, any vertex form, excuse me. We never turned one of these into the general form. And so what we can do is I'm going to come over here on the uh, left and just kind of rewrite the function. Okay, I'm just kind of review it a little bit with you guys, things that we can do with these. 
So as it is, it's in vertex format. Okay. Okay. And from vertex format, we can easily see H and K, right? Actually, this is the opposite of H, right? Remember, it's minus H. Remember, this is the thing. It would be A x minus h squared plus k. That's vertex format. And so the vertex in this case would be negative 3. So we take the opposite of what's going on here, okay? Comma and negative 6. So k we take as it is. All right, and we can verify that. I'm going to verify this information in the general form in a sec, okay? All right, so now vertex as soon as you have your vertex, y'all, you have half the other information you need, too. Because we have then the axis of symmetry is there, right? We can tell that the axis of symmetry will be located at x equal to negative 3. Okay? Et cetera, et cetera. So look, axis of symmetry. Excuse me, wrong one. Okay. Axis of symmetry which cuts the parabola in half, right? It's that uh, dotted line, right, that runs down the center of a parabola. Okay, and so at negative 3, here, let me make this a little bigger here. All right. Eh. Okay. There we go. Now, so at negative 3 is where? Let's see. 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So negative 3 is here. And so there is a dotted line here. Okay? And so that is our axis of symmetry. And so we can label that axis of symmetry. In other words, if I folded, once I put the parabola on here, if I would fold the parabola along that line, the two sides would meet up with one another, right? It would be perfectly cut in half. And now, so we have the axis of symmetry. We have our vertex, which is at that point, negative 3, negative 6, which is 2, 4, 6, right here. So this is the point, negative 3, negative 6. Maybe I shouldn't put it right there. Let me see. I know that this parabola opens upward because A is positive. Okay, remember that a, po a positive A leading coefficient is going to dictate whether it's going to tell you that it opens upward. In other words, the cup will hold water. And then if it's A is negative, like in the other example I had there, it will open downward. Right? So keep that in mind. That's important to know. Um, okay, let's see. Now let's find a point towards the, a couple points to the left, a couple points to the right. Okay, so we can have an XY chart. All right. Now important to note this: you already have the middle point. You know X at negative three is the center, right? So put that like in the middle. Right, and you want to choose points left of that and right of that, smaller than that and bigger than that. Right, so choose negative four. Just go one unit out or two units out. Keep it simple. And you want to choose negative four, but then you want to go the other direction and choose which point will be symmetrical with that. Okay, in other words, what point will have the same output because you know that's going to start happening because of symmetry. So look, f of x. So we already know that f of negative 3 gave us what? Gives us negative 6, right? That's a point on our function. So now we want to find f at negative 4. I'm going to come down below and do that. And I'm trying to get through this one quickly. f at negative 4 means I'm just going to plug that into my function. 2. So open parenthesis for that. We'll put a negative 4 plus 3. And then open so squared, close parenthesis, minus 6. Okay. I don't know if that came out right. Okay, so now I'm simplify that, and I get what? Negative 4 plus 3, which is negative 1. Square that is positive 1. So what? Negative 6 plus 2. 
So we should have a negative 4 there, okay? So negative 4. All right. Negative 4 for that. And this was negative 6. So f at negative 2 should also be that. Let's check it out just to be safe. And this is called symmetry when it is going to be, you know, if you know the output's going to come out the same. So f at negative 2. So we'll just do this now. We'll do the same thing, kind of just open the parentheses. Okay, and put minus 6. Now we're coming in, and it's telling us to plug negative 2 in. Do that. So what? 3 minus 2 inside the parentheses is 1 squared. Okay, so 2 times 1 is 2. So negative 6 plus 2, negative 4. And it works out. So that's going to be a negative 4. So here are the other points. We have negative 4. Okay, oh, negative 4, negative 4. 2, 3, 4, right here. And then negative 2, negative 4. And that's pretty much what you need here. But I'm going to get a couple of other points. Particularly, I'm going to get the intercepts, okay? So if you look at the part of the problem up here, I'm going to start filling these things in. Negative 3, negative 6, okay? The y-intercept is found by letting x equal 0. So we'll let x equal 0 and look for that, okay? Let me erase some of this. I'm going to make some room here. Hopefully you guys got that. My son, hopefully my son won't interrupt us, by the way. He just came out of the room. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Now, we're going to just, to find the y-intercept, get my pen. Ah, all right. We're going to let x equal 0. So, in other words, we're looking for f at 0. So, we evaluate the function at 0. So, 2, parentheses, 0 plus 3 squared minus 6. So, 0 plus 3, so this will be, what, 2 times, and this will be 3 squared. Right? And then 2 times 9, in other words. So, 2 times 9, 3 squared is 9. So 18 minus 6 is what? 12. Okay. So that will be the point 0, 12. Okay. And you could put that on your chart too. That's fine. And now to find the x-intercepts, is this is what I'm the, saving the big important thing for last here. To find the x-intercepts will be to find the roots, this is called the roots. The roots of one of these equations or one of these functions will be, would be the solutions to the associated uh, equation. Let me get that out of my way here. Okay. So x-intercept, let's kind of write that out. Okay. It's important you guys know that to find x-intercept, you let the y or the f of x equal zero and solve. Okay, these are roots, x-intercepts, okay? All right, so basically what's going on here is you're taking the function to, let me make sure I'm writing it down correctly, x plus 3 squared minus 6. We're setting that equal to 0, okay? And let me scroll down a little bit. Okay, so now... Let's go ahead and, and solve this. You've got a couple choices here. We could use the square root method, which I would probably need to show you guys right now because it's in this form already. I'm going to go ahead and isolate the squared part. Let me highlight what we're trying to get by itself. We're trying to get this squared binomial by itself so that we can square root both sides. Okay, So isolate that first. So in other words, we've got to add 6 to both sides, right? Let's go for it. So add 6 to both sides. All right. Cancels here. Pops up on the other side. So now we just have this. And I'm hurry. This is it for this, this skill. I'm moving on to the rational expressions after this. Now we're going to divide both sides by 2 to get the 2 off of there. So divide by 2. Divide by 2. Okay. 
So now what happens? We have the twos canceling on the left. Okay, and now I have x plus 3 in parentheses squared. And 6 divided by 2 is 3. Now that I have the part, the squared part isolated, now I can take the square root of both sides. And I'm glad I'm doing this problem because I had had a couple questions about this during the week. This skill, this particular method was one that caused some confusion. So here's what we're going to do now that we have the squared part isolated. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. What I do to one side, I must do to the other, correct? All right, and here's how this is playing out, okay? We're going to have, when you take the square root of something squared, you can extract that base. So whatever's been squared, we take it out. And, of course, on the right, we want to have plus or minus the square root of 3. And we can't really carry out square root of 3. It's not rational, so we're going to leave it like that. Next, we're going to subtract 3 from both sides. Important to remember here that when we subtract this through, we're going to put it on the front of on the right side. I'll show you the format for um, writing your solution out. Negative 3. And you always want to put that plus or minus square root off the end. And this is it. That's the answers. So look, <clears throat> it's approximately at negative 3 plus or minus square root. So or minus square root. Okay. Negative 3 plus or minus. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's right. Yep. So this is actually going to be negative 3 minus square root of 3, right? Or negative 3 plus square root of 3. Okay. So anyway, we graph our parabola. Let's go ahead and just fill that picture in so I don't forget. And we're going to move on to our rational expressions. So you'll have this neat, nifty looking little parabola that opens upward. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to say about this. I'm trying. Anybody have any questions? Are y'all there? Y'all hanging in there? Let's see. Um, I'm trying to read y'all stuff. Okay. Okay. So let's go on then to the uh, rational expressions. Okay. Alrighty. Now let me go ahead and get this opened up. Okay. Alright, here we are. Okay, here we are. Let's move on there. We saw this part already, so What's this note I have here? Just like a numerical fraction, but with algebraic expressions in the numerator and denominator. Yeah. Rational expressions. You may even run, in the future, you're going to see something called rational exponents, by the way. When you see rational exponents pop up, that means you're going to have a fraction as an exponent. Well, we'll get to that. I just wanted to point out that the word rational as an adjective in algebra means you're going to deal with fractions. So um, here, fractional expressions. Okay, it was the exponent is fractional expression exponents. So you know that word rational. It's not. It's nothing to run from. Nothing to fear. It just makes. It's just another big word that we like to use in algebra in math class. So let's talk about what's called the domain. Okay. The domain, this is like the biggest part of this. Um, everything else, you guys should know how to, to do essentially at, the, on a, on a, at least a numerical level. What the domain is, okay, and you're going to see some things, some questions come up about that. The domain is the, or the inputs we allow for x, okay, because we evaluate these expressions. Excuse me. The domain is what we allow to be put into x, okay, so that we can actually have a value come out on the other side for y, okay. Okay, we are trying to avoid, we have a domain because we want to avoid undefined situations, okay. So, let's see, un, ah, why is it not, undefined. 
calculations, and I'll just put that in quotes. And the reason I'm putting it like that is that it's basically this, a zero in the denominator is bad. <laughs> denominator. We cannot define that with any value, any number. There's no number that will represent zero trying to go into another number. It can't happen. So um, here's the deal, okay? When you have zero divided by another number, right? A is going to be anything that's not zero. Or let me just, instead of A, I'm just going to use 5 or something. That's okay. That's zero, right? So zero in the numerator is good. Okay, we don't mind that. If it were the other way around, however, we do not wish that to happen. We do not want that. That's bad. This is undefined, okay? We say that it's undefined. So if you have this, the equal sign would come, and then we'd say it's undefined as an answer. In other words, there's no value that we can use to represent that, okay? If it's defined like everything else, it's defined by the answer. So if y'all ever wondered why we say undefined, that's why, okay? So that's bad. So when we, so we're asking you for a domain, we ask you what numbers in the set of real numbers are allowed to be inputted, okay? Let me put a little, a little typing, a little writing room here. I need to bring that down. Ah, it's not working out so good to do that. Never mind. <laughs> I could do it like this. All right. There it goes. Okay. Yeah, there we have it. Yay. Got it. Okay, so now to uh, the left here, I'm going to put a couple examples of this and the idea Okay, so give the domain of dot, dot, dot. So A, <laughs> what we're concerned about is the denominator becoming zero. Remember that, okay? So if I have this, let's see, um, did I put some examples on here yet? No, not yet. Okay, let's see. Here we go. So if I have this, I may have x plus 3 over x minus 1. Okay, here's a rational expression, right? I have a polynomial over a polynomial. It happens to be a binomial over another binomial. Okay, so we want to ask yourselves, if you ask for the domain, we do this. We say only the denominator. We want to ask yourself what value or values makes this denominator zero. The denominator only. We don't care what zeros out the numerator. That's okay. That's not an issue. Equal to zero. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let me just write it out. Okay. So in in mathematical I guess language, let's write it this way. So we're going to pull the denominator out to the side. Basically, this is what you're going to do on your assignments on these parts. You pull that to the side, and you're going to write x minus 1 equal to 0, or not equal to 0, rather, like this. Okay, x minus 1, set it not equal to 0, and you can't go wrong. And you'll solve that as though you wrote equation, okay? So we'll add one to both sides, right? Cancels here. So lo and behold, x cannot equal 1. And you can see, I know you guys can see that. You probably intuitively just looked at it and said, okay, wait, well, 1 would zero it out. I'm showing you the ropes for all the broader picture because they won't all be so cut and dry. And for example, I'll give you one here, and I'll just kind of let the, this concept be for a little bit and move on. Okay, so B, here's a part B. Okay, so 
what if, and actually I may do one other one too, just quickly. So what if we have this, we may have 5 over uh, x squared minus 1. Okay. What you need to do is look at the denominator in factored form. So you'll factor the denominator. Okay. And then you'll solve, see what zeros it out, set it equal to zero, and see what values you need to exclude from the real numbers. By the way, let me summarize A's answer, by the way. Okay. This, the domain in this case would be all real numbers except for the value 1. And we can also represent the domain in interval notation. All real numbers, all the way up through 1, exclude it, do the union drop-off thing, okay, through infinity. We, we've looked at this before. It's been a while, but we did look at this in our class. So let's take this, and we need the factored form. Okay, I'm on part B now. Okay, so let's come down here. We're going to have x squared minus 1. Okay, and essentially we want it set equal to not equal 0, right? So I'm going to go ahead and factor it down here as, a, as part of an equation. So I'll have x plus 1 x minus 1, not equal to 0. And so you're just going to solve it like you did any other quadratic, okay? Dot, dot, dot. x is going to end up not being negative 1 or positive 1. Okay, or you can put plus or minus 1 if you'd like. All right, so the domain, we can actually, I could have put that up there. So I'm going to put that here, domain would be all real numbers except for negative and positive 1. Um, in interval notation, it's negative infinity to up through negative 1. We drop it off with the union in the parentheses, pick it back up right after negative 1, keep going all the way till we get to 1, drop it off with the union, start it up right after 1, all the way up through infinity. So if there are two exclusions, we have two unions, right? For every number you get to exclude, you have to do a union. Okay. Are you all with me? Everybody's following? Any questions? If you all can still hear me, please, you know, maybe type a, a yes or a, I don't know, a dot or something. Let me know you guys are still with me. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Jen. All right. I'm just making sure you all hear. You all are quiet today. I must be, uh must be weaving a, a, an interesting tale today. Cool. Good. All right. Well, I'm glad y'all are still in there, in the game. Wonderful. Let's get moving with this. And uh, I'm going, I'm really, there's not much more to talk about with this except a couple of other things. Okay. So let me go in and show you the gist of it. Let's take a look at this little word problem here. Okay. This word problem, we have the area of a rectangle is 2x to the fourth power minus 2. Okay, so I have that written in there. Let me make this bigger. Okay, so we have the area is 2x to the fourth minus 2. Alrighty, the width of the rectangle is x squared plus 1. So that's given to us here. Alright, so they're asking us to give the length. Length is unknown. What are some things we know about the area of a rectangle? That's some things you want to... When you get these problems, you guys, I have some people who are kind of confused with how to organize word problems when you get them. You definitely want to summarize your information. And For example, write area equal, you know, or just A equal. You want to write out what you know and versus what you're given in the problem. So we know area is length times width, for example. Definitely write the formula that they're referring to in the problem. We also know that area is 2x to the fourth minus 2, right? Okay. How can I get length? A good start to writing the equation you need is taking that formula 
and solving it for the variable that you need. We need L. So if we took the area formula and solved it for L, we would get area divided by width. Okay? There it is, a fraction. And are we given area? Yes. Are we Are given width? Let's start there. Okay? And so length would be that. Let's do this. 2x to the fourth minus 2, where it's the area that we were given, and divided by what I have up there for width, x squared plus 1. Okay, so what I'm going to proceed to do, and so the key to getting this, this problem correct is to simplify this rational expression. Okay, so let me put that note here for y'all, okay? Need to simplify the rational expression. And that is what this whole section, this this week is about, simplifying. I'm, gonna do, I'm about to, to bust into a bunch of examples on that for y'all before we wrap it up. This uh, rational expression. Okay, so how do we go about that? Here's the deal. This is going to be for any problem you're asked to do. Uh, simplifying a rational expression. So how to, let me give us a little room right under here. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that does it. Okay, so how to do that. I'm almost done, Noah. Sorry. Okay, let me get that here. Okay, so how to Okay, so number one, we want to factor out numerator and denominator completely. So factor completely numerators and denominators. Okay. The second thing you're going to do will be to cancel out factors that are forms of one, right? Cancel matching factors, okay? And I'm going to write factors in all caps because there is a very common error that occurs, but I'm not going to show it to you yet. I want you guys to um, only look at correct stuff first, and I'll show you the error in the end. In other words, when we do this canceling thing, we're reducing to lowest terms, right? Reduce fraction is basically what you're doing. Okay? So here's L. Let's go back up to the problem at hand. So first we want to completely factor our numerator and our denominator. Now, check that numerator out. This Don't forget the, the basic steps of factoring. Always have them all through your, in, in your head, okay? You want descending order, right? Yes. Check. We got that. We want to factor out to the front a greatest common factor. So is there a monomial factor we could take out to the front? Yeah, there's a 2. Go down the list of these steps, okay? And you, you can't go wrong. You're going to do okay. So what's left over is x to the 4th minus 1. Okay. So let's write this down. Let's do this. Bring down the denominator, which is not factorable. Okay, so now is there some, let's see, wait, hold on. Let me get this part. X squared plus one. Okay, so now we want to do what? We can still factor out our numerator some more. Okay, so 2x plus 1, x minus 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay, so what's the deal? Is there anything that will cancel? This is an example that shows you, like, it's possible that nothing will cancel. 
All right. So nothing matches. This is so important, you guys. It's important that you match up, okay? If you have a denominator down here, a, excuse me, a binomial in the denominator, put it in parentheses, okay? Your whole binomial must match. Notice we have x plus 1 up there and we have x squared plus 1. That square messes that up, so we can't cancel that. This is how it remains. Okay, unless I have a flaw somewhere where um, hopefully I didn't mess anything up. I don't think I did. So let's look at some more examples so of just simplifying rational expressions. Okay, so here comes some of those. So let's have examples. Simplify. Okay, or you guys have any questions for me? We're almost done. We're going to wrap it up pretty soon. Okay, and let me just bring in, I'm going to bring in a bunch of them, okay? So give me a sec to uh, grab those and bring them into the um, screen. Okay, let's see. Okay, so A, here's our first example, okay? So basically, you guys have all kind of dealt with something like this. If we have 25x squared over, say, 5. Okay, this is like really basic. 5 goes into itself once, right? Into 25 once. x doesn't cancel with anything. And this is a rational expression, right? We can put it into fraction form in that manner. So I kind of wanted to make note of that for you. By the way, the domain of this would be all real numbers. There'd be no exceptions, no nothing un, un nothing excluded from the real numbers because of the constant. You if, in, if there's no variable in the denominator, it's just all real numbers for your domain. In case you get asked that. Okay. And so let's do this one. Okay, there's a couple of them that are super important, a little tricky, that you guys should definitely be aware of. Some of these um, trickier issues on some of these problems. Let me put this up, make me more room. Okay. All right. And so this next one will look like this. B It's going to have x squared plus 5x minus 14 over 2 minus x. Okay, so you're going to begin by factoring the numerator. Okay, of course that's going to be two binomials. One's going to have, they're both going to have x. What are factors of 14 that would have a difference of 5? 2 and 7, right? So we're definitely going to have a 2 and a 7 in there. Okay, and then of course which of those has the the addition sign, right? The larger of the 7x and the 2x will have that middle sign. So we'll have plus 7 minus 2. Okay, let's bring down that other new denominator. Now, watch this, okay? It's binomial, like the denominator. I'm just going to put it in parentheses to kind of remind my brain that I need to only be able to cancel whole binomials. I can't cancel their individual terms. I need to cancel factors. Right? Okay, so be careful with that. Now, this is the trick here, okay? Notice that 2 minus x, and I'm going to pull that out to the side. This is a kind of important trick, okay? So pull this out to the side. All right, and we want to look at 2 minus x. All right, we have a, po a negative term and a positive, right? So we have a positive, negative. If I factor a negative out of that, what happens? Then I'll have negative 2 and a plus x. I've be everything's become opposite. Notice now if I take that solution, I put it in descending order, bring down your negative. Now what does it look like? x minus 2, right? Now it matches something in that numerator in the problem. So now I want to bring this back into the problem looking like this. So I'm going to put this back into my denominator. Just like this, negative and x minus 2. Okay, so let's kind of put that back where it goes now. 
we'll have equal x minus 2 up and x plus 7 in our numerator over, I factored a negative out, and it swaps those two terms, x minus 2, right? So you can go from here to here, make it look just like it is. If you're factoring out a negative, 2 minus x can turn into x minus 2. So that's like a little switcheroo trick, okay? A little sign trick. But what I did there in the little thought bubble was kind of the real thing that's happening, okay? All right, so now x minus 2, the entire binomial will cancel with itself. You cannot just cancel the 2s and the x's independently. You have to have the whole polynomial factor to cancel numerator to denominator. Be very careful with that. Now this subtract to this minus here that I canceled, that I factored out, will go now out to the front of the x plus 7. And this is my answer. Okay, this is my solution. So that's one, that's a trick that you have to kind of really be careful with. It's these signs, okay, sign rule. All right, one more of these, and I'm going to, actually, let me not do one more of these. I'm going to go on do some adding and subtracting. When we add fractions, what do we need, right? We need a common denominator, all right? So when we're adding these things, adding or subtracting, and or subtracting, and I'm just going to nickname it a rat expression, rat exp, okay? We need the common denominator. Now, you guys have a little experience finding the, the LCM of the denominators, right? The least common multiple. Okay, so that's something that we're going to look at right now. <clears throat> I'm going to do an example. Let me pull, um, I might just wait on one of these. I'm, I'm going to take one of these afterwards. I'm going to say, for example... A, okay. By the way, the directions now are going to read perform the indicated operation. Okay, so if it says add, then add. If it says subtract, subtract. So let's say I have this. Let's make x over x minus 3 plus x minus 4 over x squared minus 9. Okay kind of abbreviating one of those problems. So. All right. Now, in order to find our common denominator, we need to look at the denominators in factored form, right? Because the, finding a least common multiple or even a greatest common factor, for that matter, it involves us looking at thing, the factors of a number. Okay. So quickly, let me see. So I'm going to take x minus 3. That, that is in factored form already. So I'm going to, I just want to put some parentheses around it, though, to remind me. Now x squared minus 9 is x plus 3, x minus 3. So there's that factored form. So what will the least common multiple, right, of the denominators be? Just to remind you how you what you could do to get them would be over here on to the right, I have x one half plus one fifth. Just to kind of give you an idea. What did we do? We can multiply those denominators, right? And we'll see that we get 10 for these common denominators. Right? If you remember that. Uh, so we can actually multiply up these denominators. Okay, look, what do we need? 2 times 5 was 10, so 1 times 5. Okay, 5 times 2, 1 times 2. So 5, 10 plus 2, 10. So we have equivalent fractions making an equivalent expression. 7 tenths is our answer there. So let's go back to this problem here, our example from the rational expression. So we know we can multiply them, or in this case, we can take the larger of the two. So our common denominator here could be x plus 3x minus 3. See, so we have x minus 3 already, so we just need that x plus 3 there on the other one. 
So look, x plus 3. This is like our wish list. I'm writing a, it's kind of a blank fraction bar on the, you know, the parts of it are blank, I should say. All right. Okay, so first fraction, we have the x minus 3. So the extra factor is this x plus 3. Okay, this is what's new. So we need to make sure that's going to be new in the numerator as well. Okay, so let me kind of get my pen back. We already had an x, so x plus 3 is new. So it's new up there too. Here's my numerator that existed already. See, that was there already. Okay. So this is an equivalent fraction because basically by multiplying in that x plus 3 top and bottom, it's just 1 I've multiplied times this. So value's not changed. Now the second fraction is done already because this was existing in the beginning. So x minus 4 stays the same. Now we have the common denominator. And what did we do before? Once we had that common denominator, we did this step, right, where we had 5 plus 2 over 10, right? You add the numerators and put them over the common denominator. Very important. So add those things. So what you can do here to keep these nice enough for you is kind of wait to distribute. I would do that. You can choose whatever you want to do. But I would wait to add and distribute to you get to this step where you have the two fractions combined into one. It makes it a little easier, especially on adding and subtracting. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and distribute and combine like terms. Now that I have all the stuff I need to work on together, see, now I need to work on just that numerator basically for now. So we're going to stay up there and work on simplifying that. Okay, and so let's distribute that x. Okay, so what do we have? We have x squared plus 3x and plus x and minus 4. Okay, all over the common denominator. Okay, now always after you distribute, you want to combine like terms, right? Let's scroll down a little bit. And we're almost done. We're getting down to the end, you guys. So x squared plus 4x minus 4. All right, and then over x plus 3, x minus 3. Now, the numerator, can this be factored? Are there any factors of 4 that have a difference of 4? No, right? You can't answer the AC method. It's prime. So we leave it like this. This is our answer. Okay, and so that's how it is. That's, I mean, oftentimes, you guys, they'll be, that's how some of these will go. You'll get all the way down to them, and they look like they're going to be a lot of cancellations in the end, but they are not. But this, this is one of those, or it's just, this is it. That's your answer. All right, um, <clears throat> let's see, um. I would like to take a problem, let's see from there on the right, one that has a common denominator though, I guess, for time's sake. But I want to show you how it's handled here. Mm, let me see. Mm, well, okay, that's good. All right, I'm going to do this one. Uh, let's see. Whoop. Okay. I'm going to take that negative 2x plus 1 over x squared minus 4 minus negative 3x minus 1 over x squared minus 4. Okay, so we have the common denominator already on this one, right? So here's the deal with that. We're going to basically just combine your numerators, right? Look what I'm doing here, though. I'll put it in parentheses just to kind of show you. Minus is here. In parentheses, so important because you're subtracting a binomial here. Use parentheses. Crucial that you use parentheses here. All right, all that over x squared minus 4. 
Okay, and I am going to factor that in a minute, but to keep it kind of brief and quicker to write, I'm just leaving it like that for a minute. Let me go ahead and come up here for my next step. Now I'm going to distribute that negative. I'll do all my distributing and combining like terms just in my numerator. So in other words, what I need to do is just bring down that denominator for the ride for now. Okay, so negative 2x plus 1, we don't have anything to do to that that's done. Now distribute this negative here. Okay, so we want to distribute this guy. And what will happen to these signs as we go along? I'm going to end up with a plus 3x, right? and what a plus one okay be careful with your signs okay that's my point on this that's why I chose this one because the sign rules okay you really have to when you have subtraction just kind of be careful of your signs okay when you have subtraction of the rational expressions. That's the tricky one right there. So let's go ahead and combine like terms in our problem here and then we'll com continue. Okay, and I think I have time for like one more after this, a short one. But I'm going to do a multiplication. Actually, no, I'm going to do division after this. There's a division problem I need to do with y'all. Look, I'm just going autopilot, not even doing the right problem. 3x minus 2x is just going to be x. Then I have what, plus 2? Stick that bug in parentheses and factor that denominator, okay? What do we have? X plus 2, X minus 2. Yay, I got one that cancels. Look at that. Can I, I'm going to, okay, the next thing I write is going to be wrong, okay? Don't write what I'm writing now. This 2 cancels with this 2. Huh? No, don't do that. Okay, what I just did there is wrong. Don't ever cancel amongst your terms. Okay, and anybody on our autopilot, wake up. X plus 2, the whole binomial cancels with the whole binomial factor. Cancel your whole factors, not just your terms. Okay, please, never cancel terms. All right, so now the answer to this will be, what, 1 over X minus 2. Okay, so this is the last thing I have time for will be a multiplication, but I'm really going to do a division problem with y'all, okay? So we did addition and subtraction. You need to common denominators. Um, just be very careful, and, and I'm going to put more examples on the uh, YouTube channel, by the way. So go refer to that for more exampling. And of, of course, like, I'm not going to have time to get into some really tough examples, too. So I'm definitely going to do, to make sure you have posted examples on that channel, okay? I may even put some links to them on the general forum. So, okay. Here is the division problem I want to look at. It's in complex fraction form, okay? So multiply and divide. All right. So let's see. By the way, I had notes like that. Okay. So multiplying and dividing. Okay. Multiplying. <laughs> what? Okay. So um, here's the deal. When you multiply, if you have A over B times B, oh, not B. C over D. So if you're multiplying, you can go straight across and multiply. You'll have AC and BD, right? Of course, you can do your canceling and all if you need to. Here's the deal with division. Check it out. If you have A over B divided by C over D. Division of fractions, when you have a fractional divisor, that divisor will flip and become a reciprocal and it turns into multiplication. So A over B, and you must handle these this way. This is how you have to do it. Not any special situation. It's that it's a division of a fraction. So it turns into multiplication of the 
reciprocal of the divisor. So this guy flips, right? Flip. Okay, and this became multiplication. So let's check one of those out. I've got one right here. Why I just happen to have one of those problems here. Okay. So this will also combine something we looked at earlier. So wake up. Let's see if you guys will recognize it. 4 minus x over 4 plus x. All right. And then over. So this is my numerator, actually. All that over 4x over x squared minus 16. Okay. Yeah. Ouch. All right. <laughs> okay. So we can rewrite this. This is a complex fraction. Complex fractions are fractions that contain fractions in the numerator and inside the numerator and denominator too. I had to grab a sip of my drink. <clears throat> so okay. The main fraction bar is here. Let me kind of fatten up my pen here. <clears throat> so this is the main fraction bar, okay? Remember this is division, right? Okay, so let's come down a step and I'm going to rewrite this a little differently in a couple of ways. And you don't have to always write every step I write, but I'm just exhibiting to you, you know, the gist of the problem. Okay, so we have the top fraction divided by the bottom fraction. Okay, any questions on that so far? You guys doing okay? No, I don't see any questions in the question box. Okay, so now we need to turn this into multiplication. This is kind of why I chose to do a division problem. It's because it is also a multiplication example essentially because it turns into it okay so this becomes okay what happens is the dividend remains the same 4 minus x and then 4 plus x okay that first fraction is the same it will become multiplication of the reciprocal of the divisor right so we want to kind of take the reciprocal of the second fraction. So we'll have x squared minus 16 in the numerator and 4x becomes a denominator. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. So when you have multiplication of fractions, of, of rational expressions, definitely go ahead and, and factor everything out. Okay. So now what we're going to do is factor. Okay. Let's go ahead and make sure everything completely factored in and leave it in spot for now though okay I'm gonna take that over here in this direction to the right now if you have a little foresight once especially once you practice a little more you're gonna start recognizing that x squared minus 16 is gonna have an x minus 4 in it and this guy just needs a negative sign factored out and it will be x minus 4 remember from earlier our sign trick the little flipper deal. So we can make that look a little differently to suit what we needed to do. So uh, let's get that going. Okay. Can't get my pen up. Okay. So we can make that one look like this. The opposite of x minus 4. Okay. Now look, 4 plus x is just x plus 4, right? We can always do that. That's no big deal. Okay, now we're going to write our multiplication, difference of two squares, x plus 4, x minus 4, okay, over 4x, all right, so here's the deal, when you, in your multiplication problems, multiplying fractions, you have a choice, you can either start canceling here at this point, or you can put everything in the fraction, into a single fraction, and then cancel. I like to cancel it here at this point when we just get everything freshly factored completely um, because we it, it spares a lot of the mess okay like if I put everything all in one fraction and then I start canceling it's just more 
takes up more room and it adds to your chances of making an error. So this is where I prefer. You guys can choose differently. Practice it both ways. It's up to you. Um, I like to start canceling here, but it has to be multiplication between the two fractions for this kind of just to extend the fraction bar like that. Okay, look what I have. Okay, and so my x plus 4 is cancel. This negative will just go out to the front. Okay, now in my numerator, I'm going to have x minus 4, but times itself, right? So I can write x minus 4 squared. So don't be afraid to put the square on it. I mean, a lot. I often <laughs> I find students, um, it's okay if you're given the square in a problem, but you're kind of apprehensive about a plot, like writing it as your answer for some reason. But no, if it's the same factor t multiplied twice, it's a square. You could put whatever it is squared. Okay, over 4x, of course. I know that sounded very simplistic, what I just said, but it's true. Oftentimes, the simplest things are hard for us to do in algebra when it's new. But um, it's okay. That's That comes with the practice. You guys will get a lot better at this. Especially this, this these skills we're looking at today, which is just a combination of skills you've learned before. So that's my answer, by the way. And... I believe we need to call it a day. I'm going to put more examples. I could do examples of these all day. There's tons of these and little things they can throw at you, but there's nothing that will help you more than just going ahead and, and getting into the um, practice. Go ahead and start working on some stuff. If you are, are really wanting to start with simple problems, use that homework book that I put, uh, that I posted. I'm going to post that on our website too in general forum for everybody to have. So you guys start with the most basic number one problems and uh, work your way through and then do the homework assignment that's online, the turn in assignment. But um, yeah, it'll help you guys a lot. All right. Um, if Are there any questions before we go? Anybody have a question for me? Okay, you guys, y'all have a great day, all right, and um, be in touch with me. I have to take my daughter to the DMV to get her driver's permit, <laughs> so I'm going to be out of my office for about two hours, but I'm going to be back this afternoon later on, probably in about three hours I'll be back here online, but in between now and then, though, uh, if you need me, you have my phone number, and uh, y'all know how to get in touch with me. All right, and, but please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you need. Don't forget the handouts, okay? Go ahead and download them. All right.